Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And today, yes, we're going to talk a little bit more creationism. In fact, we're going to talk about a recent, uh, we'll call it the uh, Friday night news dump at Answers in Genesis. Yes, Answers in Genesis has a propensity for dropping uh, little bombs uh, very late Friday night or Saturday morning at the low ebb of the normal news cycle or the low ebb of when their traffic is, their, their, their internet traffic uh, happens. So what kind of articles do they release on late on Fridays? Um, they release the types of articles that are not going to be popular amongst the sort of uh, the average um, uh viewer of Answers in Genesis, all right? The, the typical person that's taking in their materials. They're publishing stuff on Friday night and Saturday that is either uh, messages to those outside of Young Earth Creationism, critiques, all right, that, that they want to sort of have in their, have published so that they can reference them in the future to say, yes, I responded to so-and-so. So for example, Many of Nathaniel Jensen's uh, works that are response to critics are typically found on late Friday or Saturday, where it's really just for the critics and not really to be seen by the average Young Earth creationist uh, uh, fan. In this case, they've started a series, which I've already talked about some, on a what they perceive as a danger growing within Young Earth creationism, and that's something they call Young Earth evolution. Those within the Young Earth Creationist community, those who call themselves Young Earth Creationist, and yet are in their minds under the um, sway of evolutionary biology and are, are influenced by evolutionary biology and are bringing in these foreign evolutionary biology or evolutionary theory concepts into the world of creationism and trying to make them compatible uh, with creationism. I do not think that's what they're doing, and you've seen that from my past work, but um, we're going to see the third in the series of that, that just was published on Friday. Once again, very, very late on Friday night. And you'll see from the from the cover image here, here we've got uh, Young Earth Evolution, right? And that's part of this series. And this one is now, do humans and chimps share a common ancestor? What does this have to do with a criticism of what they call the Young Earth Evolutionist? Well, look at the picture. All right. Now look at the image that's associated with this figure. You'll see that they have a, you know, they have a DNA strand. You've got a human being and a chimpanzee, and they have 99 marked out, 98 marked out, 89 or 84 marked out, and then 80% with a check mark next to it. So you're supposed to get the idea that uh, humans and chimpanzees are not very similar to one another in their DNA sequence. Uh, but of course, many you've you've heard the popular claims that uh, humans and chimpanzees only differ by 1.2 percent or 1.5 percent of their their DNA, uh, and they're saying that's that's a false perception that comes from an evolutionary uh, assumption, evolutionary perceptions, and evolutionary biologists who are making these claims, and these claims are completely false. It's obvious that humans and chimpanzees are far more different than that. They couldn't possibly be that similar. And so to use the evolutionary uh, numbers or the evolutionary biology uh, assumption of how similar they are is to, um, so to use these very high percentages is to tacitly sort of approve of the evolutionary theory framework that says that chimpanzees and humans are closely related to one another, and so not unexpectedly, they're very similar in their DNA sequences. But creationists know that really humans and chimpanzees, not only do they know that they don't share a common ancestor and so are completely different from one another, but they also know that the physical evidence backs that up because they think that uh, chimpanzees and humans only, as you see from the check mark here, are only 80% similar in their DNA. So we're gonna do a couple things here. We're gonna take a look quickly at an editor's note about this third article on Young Earth Evolution and examine the real problem that they think is going on here. Why are they calling out a particular Young Earth creationist, calling them, an, uh, calling them a, a follower of Young Earth Evolution? Then we're going to look at Georgia Purdom, who's the author of the article. We're going to look just briefly at some of the things that she says. Then we're going to go and look at some other literature and do some comparisons. And I want to challenge uh, Young Earth Creationists to do an apples to apples to comparison for us to actually know what this number means, 80%. Um, so we've got that. 
and a whole bunch of other stuff coming up next. Okay, we're ready to dig into this article. I think the way to introduce this subject and uh, the things I want to respond to um, with respect to answers in Genesis and how, uh, again, I think that they are making a horrible mistake calling out other young earth creationists over what I think are going to be nitpicky things. In fact, things that they are wrong about and that they should be listening to some of these other voices and learning uh, rather than taking the, this particular approach of trying to, uh, uh, trying to ostracize uh, these individuals. I'm going to read this uh, editor's note before the article begins, and that's going to help set our uh, frame of reference uh, and the tone <laughs> that we're going to take here uh, about uh, young earth evolution. So editors, uh, uh, first of all, I want to point out Dr. Georgia Purdom, who is a geneticist, uh, has a genetics degree from the Ohio State University. She's the author of this particular article. And this article is actually written in 2019. I remember seeing it originally in 2019. And it's been republished here February 3rd, 2023, in this series on the dangers of young Earth evolution. Uh, and so her article is just verbatim what it was in 2019, but they've added this editor's note to sort of put it into the context of why this article is an important article uh, with respect to this problem of young earth evolution that's within the midst of young earth creationism. All right, so editor's note. And again, we don't know who the editor is here. Um, who is this or who are these people that are writing these uh, commentaries and creating basically position statements for answers in Genesis? One of the commonly used stumper arguments for evolution is the supposed similarity of human and chimp DNA. If evolution were true, this would make sense, as chimps are one of our nearest relatives. All right, so he's saying, the editors are saying, yeah, if, if chimps, chimpanzees and humans are actually the close, our closest relatives and they share a common ancestor, then the supposed similarity between their DNA would make sense, all right, within an evolutionary context. They're setting themselves up for a fall here right away because they're essentially painting themselves into a position where they can't accept a very similar sequence between these two organisms because they've already admitted right up front in the first sentence that if they really are that similar, then that would be really strong evidence that they actually share a common ancestor. They know they don't share a common ancestor, so in, so in a way, they're, they're almost saying this can't possibly be. That's a big mistake, and other young Earth creationists recognize this particular mistake, as we're going to see. Um, a biblical view, however, would deny this relationship as Genesis 1-2 makes it clear that animals reproduce after their kind, and most importantly, that humans are, dis are very distinct from animals. Now, tossing in the word very distinct. Um, distinct in terms of what? Does this mean they have to be distinct with respect to their DNA? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking... Uh, as a, I'm speaking about what the mindset of a young earth creationist could yeah, maybe be, all right, versus what it actually is. And this is kind of where we're going to go. There are young earth creationists who I think are better thinkers, you know, than, than, than some of these folks that answers in Genesis. Um, oh, where was I? Oh, are very distinct from animals. We'll see. What is, what does very mean? Um, having been created in God's very image. How then do we respond to arguments that humans and chimps have DNA that is over that is 99% the same? Simply put, hogwash. All right? It's just like, that just can't be true. Can't, the 99% is just complete hogwash. Yet, sadly, there are some within the young earth creationist circles that would be quite comfortable with percentages this high Right. So now you see that the editor is, is now placing this particular article in perspective. They're saying there are some within our own myth, some some so-called young earth creationists who we're now going to find out is Dr. Todd Wood, who are willingly accept the convention, sec secular uh, conventional um, acceptance of this 99 percent similarity. Actually, 99% is a, a little bit of a, of a hedge even on their part. It's an over-exaggeration, but um, a high percentage, let's say. 
Sadly, there are some within the young earth creation circles that be quite comfortable with percentages this high, accepting the confusing claims of evolutionists and misleading those who trust the science without looking critically at these claims. <sighs> For example, Todd Wood. In publications ranging from 2006 and 2016, has continued to hold such a position of high DNA similarity, despite the fact that we at Answers in Genesis have been questioning and downgrading such high percentages since at least 2003. Look, our scientists here at Answers in Genesis have been questioning that number. We've downgraded it and made it and made humans and chimpanzees much less similar to each other. And we're young earth creationists doing all this great work, and yet Todd Wood isn't recognizing that by accepting our values, right? And he's going over there and he's accepting the evolutionary um, biologist values, right? There, you know, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe, you should be believing us. I mean, we're the Christians doing this work, and, and we're the ones that's showing they're not actually similar, and you're confounding this problem, and you're confusing our followers because we're telling them it's only 80% similar, and you're out there saying that, yeah, the, you know, the evidence suggests that humans and chimpanzees are actually very similar to each other at a genetic level, or at a, I'm sorry, at a DNA sequence level. This is still the editor's note. Dr. Georgia Purdom, who holds a PhD in molecular genetics from the Ohio State University, all right, so she's got a genetics degree from Ohio State, gotta listen to her, that she's on our side right, on Answers in Genesis site. She wrote the following piece, the piece that's now going to be uh, reissued um, for Answers Magazine 2018. She again dispels the commonly held claim and explains why as believers need not only to reject such blatantly misleading figures, but also to speak out against their use, even by other perhaps well-meaning Christians. Parroting high figures such as anywhere in the 90 percentiles only plays into the hands of those wishing to explain life, particularly human life, which is immensely special in a Christian worldview. In a senseless but arguably lucky occurrence in, an, in the universe of death and chaos. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's what Todd Wood is doing by actually suggesting numbers could be in the 90th percentile or higher. Um, he's really just arguing for this lucky occurrence in a universe of death and chaos. All right, that's the end of the editor's note. That's, that's what's framing this particular article. So then we have Georgia Purdom's article. We often use the statistic that human and chimps DNA is 98 to 99% percent, percent similar, but is that true? Um, this is a case of answers in Genesis, um, sort of overgeneralizing what the um, what the evolutionary biology community uh, says, all right, uh, and um, oversimplifying this by a lot, because the evolutionary community isn't saying that um, they're not, they're saying within a particular context, the genomes of chimpanzees and humans are ninety eight to ninety nine percent similar, right. And what Answers in Genesis has done, and actually Answers in Genesis hasn't done this. This is actually Tompkins from uh, Institute for Creation Research, which is all that Georgia Purdom does. She doesn't actually go over the, she doesn't go over how it's actually done. She just sort of reports on things that other young earth creationists have done. Uh, and so down here at the sequence level, the 98 to 99 figure comes from comparing only DNA between human and chimpanzees that aligns. This refers to any genetic sequence that is similar enough that a computer program can align them. All right, this is sort of true. Um, the 98 to 99% uh, similarity really does come from all the sequences of the majority of the human genome and chimpanzee, chimpanzee genome that lines up chromosome to chromosome that it represents the protein coding sequences in, and the, the primary sequence of the organism. Not necessarily all the, 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 some of the repeat regions and the ends of the telomeres and the centromeres, and there's other portions of the genome that are generally highly, much more variable. And as we're gonna see later, are they even variable between any two humans? And so two humans are gonna be very different from each other in some of these regions as well. Um, which is why 
comparing them with chimpanzees doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It's really in the core portion of the genome that is the coding region, the portion that is responsible for making an organism. Of that portion of the genome um, that's, that's alignable between the two, the, the DNA sequence, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Now, all the stuff she actually talks about in here, I'm like, there's really nothing uh, horribly wrong with it, although sometimes it's portrayed um, in a particular light that doesn't allow you to really see the nuances that, that you need to see. But let's just back up and ask the really simple question. Are chimpanzees and humans that similar at the genetic level? That's actually a hard, really difficult question to answer. To answer that question, you always have to ask exactly what is being compared. You have to have an apples to apples to comparison. And here's where Answers in Genesis uh, falls down on the job. When they look at their 80% value, she ends up at the end talking about how uh, chimpanzees and humans, right? There are also millions of bases outside the aligned regions that do not match at all. But these differences are not counted. If they are all counted, the similarity is only 80%, which equals 600 million differences between human and chimpanzee DNA. Um, now, some of those differences are if you have an inversion, the DNA is turned around. You also have repeat regions where you have more repeats, say, in chimpanzee than you do in human beings. And she's counting up like if you had a section that was duplicated uh, in humans, so you had an extra 100,000 base pairs that was just a duplication of another section that's the same. So that other 100,000 base pairs is 99% similar. And then you copied it. That copy also might be 98 or 99% similar to chimpanzees, but because it's an extra piece of DNA, she's gonna count all 100,000 base pairs as being differences. Each one of those is a different, right? Each base pair is a base pair that doesn't exist in chimpanzees, so therefore that's a difference. And when you add that all up, you're gonna get a larger percentage of total difference between the genomes. And I'm gonna say, okay, that's fine, right? If you want to have a certain way of accounting and you want to count every possible difference as, as counting as much of a difference as possible, um, go ahead and do that and come up with a value that's 84%. Actually, even the 80% is low compared to even Tompkins uh, now, who's I think at 84%. Go ahead and do that, right? Call it 80%. But then my question is going to be, and always has been, what does that 80% mean? What does the 80% mean? Is that a meaningful number? And so let's, let's, uh, let's look at it in another way. Oh, I'll, I'll stop. I'll, I'll say, I, I, I have to continue that thought. I've asked this question to Tompkins uh, you know, about this analysis, about this analysis of genetic similarity. I said, okay, so... Humans and chimpanzees, these two particular genomes are 80% different. What if you were to compare um, two human beings, any two human beings on Earth, and use your form of statistical analysis, how different would they be? What would be the percentage of similarity? Right? Because I think most people think, oh, human beings, we're all really similar to each other. And answers in Genesis would say, we're all really similar to each other. They make a big deal about how genetically similar we are, you know, right? There's... They really aren't race. Race really isn't anything in terms of uh, with respect to genetics. There's hardly any differences. So you might think that they believe that the difference between one human being and another human being is less than 1%, right? That we're all 99.5% or 99.8% the same, very similar to each other. We only differ by hundreds of thousands of base pairs out of billions. This is what I would tell my class. I would say, to my class, I would say, we're all extraordinarily similar all right, at a genetic level. There aren't that many differences um, between us. But if they use their statistical accounting, their particular way of counting up the differences, which is meant to accentuate the total number of differences, it, it, it tries to find every possible difference and count it as as much difference as possible. All right, that's what, that's what this model does that has been built to try to show humans and chimpanzees are different. So what I'm saying is if you take that same exact method of doing a statistically assessing the genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees and you apply it to two individual human beings, 
all right, two of the most genetically distinct uh, lineages of living human beings, which again, I would say all human beings are, are really quite similar uh, to one another. But they were to use their statistical package. I want to know how different would they be? Because they haven't done that analysis. And they don't seem to want to do that analysis. And you know why they don't want to do that analysis? Because their analysis is probably going to find out that two human beings might only be 92% similar to each other. A huge difference between them. And if, if two human beings are only 92 or 93% similar to one another, so that means there's 7 or 8% difference, genetic difference between any two human beings, that would then argue that two human beings are genetically very distinct from one another. And they don't want to say that. They want to say they're really similar to one another. And they want to highlight that there's such a difference between chimpanzees and humans. They can't possibly be related to one another. They can't have come from a common ancestor. What about chimpanzees and Neanderthals? They say Neanderthals are just another, you know, they're just a variation of modern humans, right? Not hardly any different. Have they applied their statistic? Have they taken a, a Neanderthal genome, determined how many duplications they have, how many insertions, how many deletions, how many, uh, you know, how many differences in, in a, a variety of different aspects of their genome? If you were to count up and use their method of doing statistical analysis on Neanderthals and human beings, would they come up with Neanderthals being almost genetically the same as human beings, or would they come up with them only being 90% similar? In which case, that sure doesn't sound like they're the same species. All right, so here's who they're complaining about. They're complaining about Todd Wood, and they're saying, the editor's saying, look, Todd Wood is, is agreeing that humans and chimpanzees uh, share a lot of genetic similarity to one another. What's up with that? Let's go to one of those papers, one of Todd Wood's papers, and see what he's really saying here. Is Todd Wood suggesting that because they're really similar, that Human beings and chimpanzees might share a common ancestor? <laughs> no way. Todd Wood is not saying that, right? He has never, ever suggested that that is a possibility. He's completely convinced that humans and chimpanzees uh, do not have a common ancestor, that they're created separately. But he acknowledges the similarities genetically between humans and chimpanzees. And he considers that and talks about it and wonders how we might be able to explain that. And he comes up with a bunch of alternative hypotheses for how to explain that genetic similarity. The fact he's accepting high genetic similarity doesn't mean he is uh, an evolutionary biologist and that he, he feels like this is the result of common ancestry. He's just acknowledging the data that exists. So let's take a look at a little bit of that. All right. So. He has an occasional paper from a journal that uh, he, he is involved with they're called the BSG and uh, Chimpanzee Genome and the Problem of Genetic Similarity from 2006. A bit of an old paper, but I think it's going to give us what we need to see here. So uh, and it is one that Georgia Purdom referenced, oh, sorry, that uh, that the editor uh, referenced and said was problematic. All right, so let's scroll down. The Chimpanzee Genome and the Problem of Biological Similarity the problem of biological similarity. So he's acknowledging there is biological similarity between chimpanzees and humans. Um, that, that, to that, there really isn't any doubt. And why is it a problem? Because he believes that they don't, have, they don't share common ancestors. So how are we going to solve this problem? Evidence for the great similarity between chimpanzees and humans was recently reinforced. So this is back in 2006. So now this is only just when the chim chimpanzee genome is being published with the publication of the rough draft of the, of the chimpanzee genome. Now, today, we have multiple chimpanzee genomes, and we, can, we have a, a lot better chimpanzee genomes in, in the sense that they've been sequenced more thoroughly. But really, the story hasn't changed a whole lot since then. The sequence in 361,000 uh, 3 separate pieces of genome that they constructed with a medium length of 15,700 nucleotides. So 15,000 times 361,000, you know, that's billions of base pairs, right, that they've sequenced from the chim chimpanzee genome. The sequence differs from the human genome by 35 million nucleotide mismatches. Now, this is important to get. You take those um, billion base pairs 
and you line them up against the human genome and, and you, you can line that sequence up uh, and where it lines up, and it doesn't line up every single spot. Some places humans have extra base pairs that chimpanzees don't have and some places chimpanzees have extra sequence that humans don't have. But everywhere it does line up, right? Everywhere we share sequence with one another, the same, uh, the same genes, the same stuff, right? And we line that up, we find that there's 35 million nucleotide mismatches. Now, it sounds like an enormous number of mismatches, a number of differences uh, between them. But that's only 1.23%, right? 1.23% of the sequence that's alignable. So that's where you get your 98.5 or 98.6% uh, similarity between humans and chimpanzees based on the sequence that we share. And then looking at where are there little individual differences in that shared sequence. And there's also 10 million alignment gaps. So in this case, they found 10 million different places where there are extra base pairs, like I said, in one or the other. And if you count for the total amount of length that represents, that's another three to 4%. So right here, Todd Wood is saying that there's among a line sequence, 98 point something percent, and then you have an extra three or 4%. So that's gonna add up to five or so percent. So that's only 95% similar. Um, you get to be careful when you hear these, these uh, references to how similar human and chimpanzee genomes are. You have to understand what are, the, what are they comparing, right? Are you comparing just protein coding sequence? Because if you're looking just at the protein coding sequences, the sequences that code for the proteins and the enzymes that are the main functional units of any organism, there, that's, only, that's well above 98% similarity. And between you and I, Right, between me and anyone out there listening, you and I at our protein coding level uh, or our, our DNA level that codes for proteins, we're more than 99% similar, all right? Probably actually 99 point, maybe seven or eight percent. So very, very high similar. We have very few differences in those particular locations. So where are the differences? The differences are found outside of those genes, sometimes in regions that don't appear to have any coding significance, right? Or any significance in terms of, of, um, of the uh, regulatory control uh, of us. Lots of repeat sequences and extra stuff out there. Here we go. Rather than attempting to explain the, similar, the similarity, here, I, I here propose principles that can guide creationist research in this area. I find that creationist genoma, genomics requires uh, three important theories that still need to be developed before fruitful uh, research can commence. All right, so he's gonna talk about three different ways of thinking that might help us, help us or help young earth creationists understand the similarities that exist and have been shown to exist in the primary sequence of these two organisms. All right, so that's where that's where he's he's saying that there is this similarity. He's not wrong about this, and for answers in Genesis to castigate uh, Todd Wood for saying that there's only eighty percent similarity. Well, okay, in this, if you count it up in a certain way, maybe eighty percent. All right. In a very, I'll say a very disingenuous way, a way that no molecular biologist is ever going to do. It's like, it's like completely, a completely unique method to young earth creationists to count this way. But that means that that's the only analysis they've ever done. They've only ever done an analysis between chimpanzees and humans. They haven't done an analysis between two chimpanzees, two human beings, a human and a Denisovan. They haven't done a comparison between a, a chimpanzee and a gorilla, a chimpanzee and a, an orangutan. They have no idea how different those are from one another to actually compare what 80% means. What if the difference between a human, like I said before, what if the difference between a human and a human is 90%? Well, what is a creationist gonna do with that? How are they supposed to respond to that? So what Todd Wood's doing is saying, is like this number represents a real value that many people have calculated of the differences in the primary sequence between these two organisms. And that still has to be explained, even if Answers in Genesis wants to go and have this crazy accounting method and act like there's all these other things that are, that are different. 
that yes might be different but because there's nothing to compare it to it's just a made-up number really and it is very much a made-up number it's not a number that's going to hold up i don't think to to any kind of scrutiny and it has been scrutinized uh, by a number of people uh, i want to i want to go down here and i want to show you something that's in his paper All right he looks at the differences between chimpanzees uh, talks extensively about the chimpanzee genome and all the different elements in it. And in it, he acknowledges that there are repeat units. There are like the telomeres. There are other places in the genome where there's inversions, where the, gene, the DNA has been one order, has been flipped around, so it's in a different order in human beings. What Answers in Genesis does there is they, they count that as being like that whole segment is different, right? It, it, because you have a million base pairs that are turned around, well, all million base pairs then represents a difference between a chimpanzee and a human. Okay, if you want to count that as a million differences, one big inversion, and you want to count that as a million differences, well, then, yes, you're going to say that organisms aren't very similar. But guess what? There are human beings that have chromosomes that have inversions in them that are absolutely huge. And, and you're going to end up with big differences even between human beings. Not, as, not as big a difference as between a chimpanzee and a human, but between any two humans, you potentially are going to have five, six, seven, eight percent difference between them if you use this particular accounting method. In which case, your 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 data is uninformative, unhelpful. All it's there for, really, the only thing this eighty percent is there for, is to just make yourselves feel like you don't have to explain the similarities. It's like, oh, look how different they are. All right, well, it's obvious they're not related to one another, so we don't actually have to think about that. We don't have to, like, try to understand what, why God made two different organisms that are, don't share a common ancestor but share a whole bunch of sequences at very high sequence frequency, uh, um, uh, percentages. We don't have to explain that because we've just kind of thrown out this 80% number and said, well, they're obviously really different from each other. <laughs> okay. Every organism is obviously really different from each other, even ones that share a common ancestor. So it doesn't help you. Um, I'm probably not going to have time to do it because uh, I yeah, can tell I'm not going to have time to do it. I'm going to do one analysis, but I'm not going to get to doing like dogs and foxes or wolves and foxes. But Ken Ham says that, well, Ken, well, answers in Genesis. There was two canines on the ark. Those two canines got off the ark, became wolves and coyotes. Um, if we go in and look at their genomes and we ask how different are they and we were to apply answers in Genesis method of analysis of calculating the genetic similarity between the two, how similar do you think those two would be? They're in the same kind. They share a common ancestor. I can tell you what, they're going to be more different than a chimpanzee and human. They have not, they have not done that analysis. I don't care to do it. It's a complicated thing that Hardly anyone can, and I can't exactly figure out exactly how they've done it. It's a lot of kind of like, we did this stuff, but it would be hard to replicate. I want them to do it. You know, if you want to do science, you want to do research, you got to, you got to have a, re you have to compare to other organisms so you know what this 80% similarity means. All right. You know, here's what other previous creationist responses are to this particular problem. It's not just Todd Wood that's, you know, seen that there's very similar sequences between chimpanzees and humans. And they have other creationists have come up with other possible explanations for this data. See, this is a really good paper in the sense of giving you a broad perspective of where creationists have thought about this and how they've thought about it. Answers in Genesis comes along and just sort of like, oh, they've just... Uh, sucked up an evolutionary assumption and you need not pay attention to it we need not even think about this whole thing of why these are related all right here we are okay so if we come down here and we look at a segment of and he just has an example of a, the similarity in the region of the human chimpanzee uh, genomes all right and the chicken so we have chicken mouse and chimpanzee and we're just taking a look at a piece of chromosome number 11, base pair zero through, in this case, up to 200,000. So that's actually a very small portion of chromosome number 11, which I'm sure is probably, uh, you know, I don't know for sure, but we'll, we'll just say maybe 30 million base pairs in length. 
Chromosome number one is the longest, and then they get shorter as you go to the other chromosomes. So we get down to chromosome number 11. Let's just say we got 30 million base pairs. We're only looking at 200,000 of them, but it's sort of like a, you know, you could look at any section you want. You're probably going to see similar results. And so in this particular 200,000 base pair, there are a couple different genes, right? That's what this uh, red is up here. So the red line, you see the dark bars there in the red? That's the coding sequence, right? And so the coding sequences of those, uh, um, that's where the protein coding sequences and everything in between are introns, so intervening sequence in between. And typically what happens is your coding sequence is more conserved. You have less variation there because you can't afford to play around with your coding sequence as much. You can't afford to have as many mutations. And the regions between might have more variation the longer it's been since you have a, you've shared a common ancestor. All right, so you and I share a common ancestor in the past. If we were to look at our protein coding genes, we'd be really similar, but our introns, we'd be less similar to each other because they've accumulated more changes over time. All right, so now, down here, what he's done is he said, Look, if you compare the human being, zero to 200,000, and you compare that to chimpanzees, all right, where these three different genes are, right? Chimpanzees have the same three genes in the same location on chromosome number 11. And if you go across their sequence and you ask how different is the individual nucleotide, so this little bar right here, you know, if you compare one human to another human, or the reference times the reference, of course, it's going to be 100% the same. Every single base pair is the same. If you compared one human to another human being, I would expect some small variation, but so small you wouldn't even see it here. So like 99.9, .9, right? One base pair every once in a while is gonna differ and we can't even really see that on that line. So you and I, really similar to one another uh, at the DNA sequence level. And then you take a compare chimps, so you see this? It's kind of a squiggly line here. And the squiggly line, there's some dots down here too. That represents most of it's 100% the same. Like most locations, there's a lot of locations where a chimpanzee and human have exactly the same sequence uh, in, in these three different genes and the region between the genes, by the way. Uh, and there's a couple dots that fall below the 100%. You know, so if some of them fall all the way down to like the 90%. So there's a couple little locations within the genes where, oh, there's a little area where there's some differences between chimpanzees and humans, but then the rest of it's all the same. So it's kind of like, you go a little ways, a lot of the same, and then changes, and then, then, it's, then it's the same again. All right, and some of those differences, again, you can't see it mapped really well here, but where the protein coding sequence is, is where most of the similarity is. Now, if you compare that to a mouse, all right, and in evolutionary theory, mice are much more distantly related than chimpanzees. And so uh, you would expect that mice should have a lot more differences since they would share a common ancestor a lot longer in the past. And what you'll see is you have everything from 50% up to you know 90% or so similarity. And so these dots represent uh, all these, these areas. And the dots actually are found in little streaky areas here representing where the protein coding sequences are. In other words, the protein coding sequences still have some similarity. But the regions between them, some of them just have white gaps, meaning there isn't any space there because maybe their gene doesn't even have that gap or it has a different gap or the similarity is so low that it's already measurable. You can't really identify what the similarity is there. It's The sequence is all just different and you don't know whether it comes from a common origin or not. Um, and if you compare it to a chicken, well, chickens are birds, right? And so you expect even less similarity. They have the same genes and the same essentially the same organization on those chromosomes, but their actual DNA sequence uh, is far more different. So what Todd Wood is pointing out here is just the simple observation that if you compare a chimpanzee and you just go across the genome, for the majority of the genome, there's barely any difference, you know, where we share our genes. Right, and so that's a common platform where both organisms are using the same genes in the same ways, um, and they have this, because they have pretty much the same sequences. All right now, if you listen to Answers in Genesis and you just hear them and you read this article by Georgia Purdom, and she's like, oh, "It's not ninety-nine percent. It's not ninety-eight percent. It's eighty percent similar." Um, if we really were just eighty percent similar, then how would you get this incredibly high similarity across hundreds of thousands of base pairs? Okay, I feel like I'm not being uh, terribly clear here. Um, and if you don't know genomics, and I'm, I'm struggling to figure out how deep to go uh, in this and, and what terminology to use. So let me try something different. Let's take a look at 
some of the modern literature and how they talk about the differences between humans and chimpanzees. And I want to show that uh, Georgia Perm and others are actually exaggerating when they say that uh, evolutionary biologists believe we're that similar, right? That, that the DNA sequence, I'm sorry, that the genome is that similar. All evolutionary biologists know that there are significant differences in the genome structure between humans and chimpanzees. Um, it's not that there's, they believe that the genome overall is absolutely only 98.5, uh, is 98.5% similar. If you account for other things and you, you account for it in different ways, you will get different percentages. And they know this, but they also do apples to apples comparisons where they're comparing one human to another human and they're looking at the differences in the same way and looking at how different organisms are between different groups. And when you break that down and you look at that, you say like, Humans and chimpanzees are as similar to one another as two other like closely related species between when you look at other species around the world, right? If you look at coyotes and wolves, right, say, right? If you look at, uh, but if you look at a red fox and a wolf, they're even more different than a chimpanzee and a human. So Answers in Genesis has all these different kinds of organisms, right? God created a kind and they include lots and lots of species that all came from a common ancestor. Wouldn't you expect those to be about as genetically similar to one another as human beings are to one another? Because they're one kind as well. Um, if you use Answers in Genesis methodology, you're going to find out, you're gonna be, they're going to be sorely disappointed in the numbers that they get and the comparisons that they do. So this is published in uh, BMC uh, Genomics. And this is 2020, the difference between human and chimpanzee genomes and their implications in gene expression, protein functions, and biochemical properties uh, the difference between two organisms is much more than just what their DNA sequence is. And this seems to be what Answers in Genesis is, is, is fighting about. They're, 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 they want to say that the DNA sequence or the, the genome structure is so different. Because if, if they were to acknowledge that it was really very, very similar, it's as if they think they would have to accept that they have a common ancestor. Now, I think they would have to accept that that's the appearance of that. But as Todd Wood is going to say, there's much more that makes up a human being than simply their DNA sequence, all right, and the order of their genes. There's lots of other things that go into what makes a particular organism distinctive. And he, as a Christian, and one who believes in young earth creationism and a separate origin of human beings is saying, there's a whole bunch of other things that I can identify in, among human beings that make them unique. I don't need to have them have incredible genetic diversity from other organisms in order to consider them to be unique. I don't understand why Answers in Genesis can't understand that. It seems like they just feel like they're forced to say that they are genetically different. And to me, it's almost because they've succumbed to evolutionary thought themselves. It's like, the, I read the editor's note. It's like the first sentence, like, that really would look like they were related to one another, you know, if they had similar sequences. They're giving up the game right there. <laughs> they're just they're just giving it to evolutionary biologists and saying like, yeah, you know what? If if they really share that much similarity, then they probably do share a common ancestry. So now we're forcing ourselves to actually find more genetic differences than really exist, or accounting for them in different ways, and trying to trick our followers into believing them th that they're only eighty percent similar, and somehow that's more dissimilar than other organisms are to each other. And that's not the case. Chimpanzees are the closest relative of humans. The divergence between human and chimpanzee ancestors dates back to approximately 6.5 to 7.5 million years ago. Genetic features distinguishing us from chimpanzees and making us humans uh, are, are still of a great interest. After divergence of their common ancestor, human and chimpanzee genomes underwent multiple changes, including single nucleotide substitutions. That's where individual single nucleotides, A, T, Cs, and Gs have changed. That's usually what's being counted when you're talking about DNA similarity uh, matrices. Deletions and duplications of DNA. Fragments of different sizes, insertions, or transposable elements. Chunks of DNA have been moved from other organisms even, or transposed from one location to another. So in the human genome, this piece of DNA is here, but in another genome, it's somewhere else because it's been moved and transposed. 
and chromosomal rearrangements. There are significant chromosomal differences between chimpanzees and humans, most notably chromosome number two, which appears to be two fused chromosomes of chimpanzees. So that, by the way, answers in Genesis, the way they are gonna count that up as being a, a huge chromosomal difference between the two, when is it really that much of a difference? Human-specific single nucleotide alterations constitute 1.23% of human DNA. See, that number hasn't changed since uh, uh, Todd Wood back in 2006, and so this is 2020. In other words, we've had the majority of the, of the functional portion of the genome, um, or the majority of the sequence that aligns and is in common, in alignment. And that's only shares 1.23% difference in single nucleotide alterations. And that's the caveat here. We're talking about single nucleotide changes, where you can align the two sequences, where you see an A and a C, A and T, a C and a G difference. That's 1.23% of the genome that's different. If you're careful when you listen to literature and read literature, you'll find that that should always be referenced as to the context. The context is single nucleotide polymorphisms or changes. Um, Whereas more extended deletions and insertions cover 3% of our genome. So there are larger chunks that don't have any alignment. Chimpanzees don't have this portion of our genome. We don't have this portion of their genome. That constitutes another 3%. So right there, we're already at 4 point something percent. Moreover, much higher proportion is made of differential chromosomal inversions and translocations comprising several megabyte long regions, megabyte or million base pair regions, or even whole chromosomes, that's chromosome number two. However, despite the extensive knowledge of structural genomic changes and accompanying human evolution, we still cannot identify with certainty the causes of the, the causative genes of human uh, identity. I mean, that's just talking about, we're not really sure which combination of genes actually makes up the, like, the majority of the physical difference or even physical behavioral difference between humans and chimpanzees. But the point here is that this is, this is saying, is saying if, you, if you look at this now, 1.23%, that's a line sequence and the individual changes. Then you have another 3%, which is stuff that's present or absent between the two genomes. And then you have millions of base pairs that are like a chunk in the genome is like turned around. That's what inversion is. Inversion is like they were in this order and then a section of the chromosome is flipped around and is read in the opposite direction in the other genome. Well, the same information's there between the two genomes. And when you line up that sequence of what's been flipped around, when you line that sequence up and you say, how many differences are there? That's still 1.23% difference. But if you say, how similar are the two genomes? You could say that, well, this one has a million base pairs that have been turned around. And if I want to, I could call that a million differences, right? Because every single position where that sequence is, if you were to line the two up and not flip the other one around, you would say, oh, they're all different. All million base pairs are different because they're in a different order. Okay, does that make an organism functionally different from another organism because they have a million base pairs turned around? I can tell you that's you don't want to argue that that's the case, right? You don't want to just say, oh, okay, well, they're turned around, so therefore that makes us different than chimpanzees because <laughs> it's like <laughs> I might have a million base pair fragment in my own chromosome that's flipped around compared to yours, right? And I don't think that makes you a human and me not a human being, okay? But by functionally, we're working just the same way. So you can have these sorts of large differences. Sometimes they make an actual difference. A lot of times they may not make any difference in the, in the functionality of an organism. Um, all right, so I've just shown you a paper that, that just shows you like, yes, evolutionary biologists, biolog why do I say evolutionary biologists? Biologists are completely aware of significant differences structurally in the genome and the overall similarity. Now, how do you measure that overall similarity? It's hard to like put a single number on that because you'd have to assign what does it mean to have an inversion? What, what is a missing, if you're missing 400 base pairs um, and the other organism has those 400 base pairs, are the, is that 400 differences between one organism and another? Or is that really one difference? One organism either lost 400 base pairs 
or one organism gain 400 base pairs as a chunk, right? Because it could be a translocation. It could be a duplication of a gene. But that's another thing. If a human being has two copies of a gene, of the same gene, and a, and a chimpanzee only has one copy of that gene, and maybe in a human being, one of the copies is a defunct gene. It has a mutation, and so it doesn't work. How, how do you count that? How do you count the differences there? Is that one difference between those two organisms? Or is that, uh, oh, that gene was 100,000 base pairs, and you have an extra copy of it, so that's 100,000 differences because I'm counting up every individual base pair difference. See, that's kind of what, kind of, although Answers in Genesis has a very contorted way of doing this. Actually, I should say, Institute for Creation Research, because Answers in Genesis hasn't done any of this work. ICR has a very contorted way of calculating these things, and um, they're counting up every single possible difference as a difference. Um, yeah, if evolutionary biologists, biologists wanted to count the differences that way, they could do that, and they might get a number that was like, yeah, we're only like 82% similar using this way of, of accounting. That form of counting is completely unhelpful because as I've been pointing out over and over and over again, two other species of any other species out there within the same kind of organism that young earth creationists recognize as being very closely related and had a common ancestor just 4,000 years ago are only 80% similar too, or maybe less. They have just as many genomic differences that if you, if you care to add them up that way are going to be really different. And so the 80% number is just, it, it is a, it's a meaningless number until they put some context around it, which means they have to do the comparisons. They have to compare other organisms using the same method so you can understand what that method's results mean. They have not done that. And they've known they need to do this for 10 years. See, I'm getting kind of excited now. Let me do a demo. Let's do a demo. Um, let's just ask ourselves how similar two organisms are. Um, I've done this a lot of times with mitochondrial DNA, and I've compared mitochondrial DNA from different species to show like how different they are at the sequence level. Um, but I just want to show you how that's done. So let me do a little demo of that. I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be kind of fun to do. Let's go to the National Library of Medicine, National Center of Biotechnology Information, hosted by the National Institutes of Health. These are your tax dollars at work. We're going to put the tax dollars to work right now. Um, this is uh, NCBI. If you just type in NCBI to your browser, uh, it's going to bring you to a page like this or close to it. You can just click on NIH here and get to the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Um, we're not going to look at all databases. We're going to come over here to nucleotide. We want to search for a particular nucleotide sequence. And the one we're going to see, uh, search for is uh, gorilla. All right, gorilla. Let's look at the gorilla mitochondrial genome. We're going to look at the mitochondrial genome because it's the easiest thing to look at. Um, it, the whole genome is really complex. So we're just going to use the mitochondrial genome as a surrogate for looking at overall DNA sequence level similarity. So gorilla, and, and actually they suggest the gorilla mitochondrial genome, so we don't even have to really search for it. It's already gonna give it to us. So here we have Western gorilla mitochondrial reference genome. It's uh, 1, 000, or 16,364 base pairs in size, and it's a circle, right? That's what's in the mitochondrial. You have a mitochondrial genome as well, which is almost the same size. So we've got uh, gorilla, gorilla. And uh, now that we have that, let's click on, well, let's click on that. So we're going to go to what's called the accession for that. And the accession, the GenBank accession, uh, looks like this. And if you've never seen one of these before, it just looks like a bunch of garble. But what we have is we have a uh, accession number. So if you knew that number, you could we could have just searched for it with that number. Uh, it's 16,364 base pairs. It's circular. Uh, it comes from the organism Gorilla Gorilla. And you can see how they classify that. And let me scroll down here so you can see it. But uh, these are all the different genes. And down here, there it is. There's the 16,000 A, T, Cs, and Gs. So that's the code that we have sequenced from one particular gorilla. It turns out there's hundreds of gorilla sequences because we've sequenced hundreds of individual gorillas so we can understand the variation within gorillas of mitochondrial genomes. But what we want to do is we want to blast this sequence. We want to take the entire 16,000 base pairs and we want to compare it to 
other primates. And we're going to ask this question. Here's my question. If humans and chimpanzees are only 80% similar, we can compare a human and a chimpanzee mitochondrial genome and get a, a rough similarity of the mitochondrial genome. How similar is a gorilla and a chimpanzee or a gorilla and a, um, a, a orangutan? Because don't forget, Answers in Genesis, if, if you didn't know this, Answers in Genesis has suggested strongly that um, only 4,000 years ago, there were no gorillas, chimpanzees, or orangutans. There was a common ancestor to the three. The common ancestor was on the ark, Noah's ark, and then diverged into those three major lineages, which actually includes several other species within those lineages, and also the Australopithecus scenes. But all right, so diverged into a bunch of stuff. All right, so they're all the same kind. They're related by common ancestry. So we're going to ask the question, how similar is a gorilla to an orangutan? And how similar is a gorilla to a chimpanzee? And how are we going to do that? We're going to take the genome, the entire genome of a mitochondria from a gorilla. And we're going to say, if a gorilla, a chimpanzee, and an orangutan shared a common ancestor in the past, they would have had the same mitochondrial genome at some point with the exact same sequence. In other words, the female, whatever it was, primate, grade ape that was on Noah's Ark, she had a particular mitochondrial genome. And then that mitochondrial genome got passed to her offspring, her daughters. Those daughters then diverged into different species that we know of as being called gorillas and chimpanzees. As they diverged, their mitochondrial genomes would have accumulated mutations. So any differences between an orangutan and a, and a, and a modern uh, gorilla today have to be the result of mutations that have occurred since a common ancestor. So how many differences are there? Let's find out. Let's find that out. And here's how you're going to do it. I clicked on blast. It took the accession number. So it says, okay, we know you're talking about the gorilla mitochondrial genome here. We're going to put it in this box. I don't have to put all 16,000 base pairs here. I'm just putting the accession number in. It will go and collect that for me and insert it into the box when I uh, go ahead and blast this thing, it's called. Now, what do I want to compare to? Choose my search set. I want to compare to the nucleotide collection, which is hundreds of billions, trillions of base pairs of data in their data set, right? All the sequence that we know of that has been published. Uh, and I've already, I've already put this in here because I did this earlier just to be sure it works, right? Uh, I said I want to compare to a particular organism, not all organisms. I want to compare to a particular organism, uh, Pongo, uh, and that is orangutan. But I also want to compare to Pan paniscus, which is one of the chimpanzees. Right? So I don't have to change anything else. I'm looking for highly similar sequences. It wouldn't matter if I chose less similar or not. It's going to find me the most similar on down. And so I am going to click this thing here. It says blast. And it's going to search. And what it's doing right now is it's taking all 16,000 base pairs of a gorilla. And right now on a supercomputer somewhere, it's comparing to all the other sequences. Well, actually, it's comparing to a gorilla. It's comparing to orangutan and chimpanzee sequences. And it's going to say, let's find similar sequences. Other mitochondrial genomes will line them all up. They're going to do an alignment of the entire sequence with each other. And they're going to tell me how similar it is. We're going to get a percent. Hey, we're done already. That didn't take very long. It depends on what time of day you do this, by the way. Um, if, if you'd like to try this and you're doing it at, say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, well, or you're really between 10 and 2, then you got Europeans doing it and Americans doing it, and it's, it can get kind of a, a little busy. All right, so what are we looking at here? We're saying, okay, we did a comparison, and what we found was what was the most similar sequence to the gorilla sequence? It's not going to pick up other gorilla sequences because I told it not to look for other gorillas. So we're not comparing gorilla to gorilla right now. Compared to the first and most similar sequence to a gorilla is a chimpanzee. All right, and that chimpanzee sequence uh, has a 98%, oh, sorry, it's only 90% similar. All right, 90% similar, and it covers 98% of the same sequence. So that means it must have either a few extra base pairs or a few fewer base pairs than the gorilla does. And overall, its percent identity, which would be the sequence similarity, 
is 90%. Got that? 90% uh, between those two. Now, I'm going to click on the name over here, the description. And what that's going to do is it's going to take me down to the alignment. You see up here you have descriptions, graphicals. You know, let's look at the graphical summary. Yeah, here's all the sequences that came with that are similar uh, and how similar they are. They're, they're get really high scores, meaning they're really similar. Uh, but I want to go to the alignment. We want to actually see the alignment. So let's click on alignments, and here we go. That first one, pan paniscus, uh, complete genome. How similar is it? Okay, it had 14,021 identical base pairs to the gorilla out of 15,572. So it could align 15,572 base pairs, 14,021 uh, were the same, identical. That's where you get your 90%. So there's your 90% value. Uh, and look down here. See, like there's a T here in gorilla and there's a C in chimpanzee. There's two C's over here in gorilla and there's two T's over here. Uh, let's scroll down a little ways. Oh, here's this is interesting. This is different. See this? There's three dashes. Three dashes means there's three gaps there. I mean, the gorilla has no base pairs right there. It's missing those. In other words, the gorilla genome just goes C, A, A, T, and then continues C, 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 C. I mean, it doesn't know it's missing three base pairs. It's just a continuous strand. But the chimpanzee has three extra base pairs at that position, a G, C, C. I haven't looked at this exact site, but it very well could be this is in a protein coding sequence. And remember, three base pairs makes one amino acid. So that would mean the gorilla has one fewer amino acids in its protein than the chimpanzee does. That could actually make some significant difference, or it may be relatively neutral. But that reminds me to come up here. Gaps, 27 out of 15,572. So there's actually there's 27 individual gaps where the, either one of these different taxa is missing or has extra base pairs. So if you added the two together, 27 plus all those differences, you get your overall genetic similarity between these two organisms. How many, oh yeah, but let's, let's add it up. 14,021 compared to 15,572 would be, let me do my math here, that would be 1,551. 1,500. I'm sorry. Yes, 1,551 differences. 1,551 individual A, T, Cs, and Gs are different out of the 15,000-something base pairs that we uh, did a comparison of. All right, so 90% similar. Now, do you want to know how similar a human and chimpanzee are? Right? Do the, We did the same comparison. I'm not going to do it, but uh, we could do that comparison. Um, uh, let's what what the heck we're gonna do it let's do it let's uh, get rid of this get rid of this and let's go homo sapien let's compare a gorilla and a homo sapien how similar are those two then I'll tell you how similar a chimpanzee is in a human uh, let's do that real quick no, depends on how fast the computer is, but uh, how many other people are using it right now. Da, 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 da. Two seconds to update. Just updated. It's continuing to update. Oh, now we got to wait four more seconds. Here we go. Here we go. There we are. Hum Homo sapiens, isolate. Complete genome, the, the one that was the most similar. Oh, it found lots and 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 lots of human sequence of genomes. Yeah, because there's like hundreds of thousands of people that have had their mitochondrial genome sequence, their whole genome. So there's a lot to compare to. Uh, you notice how similar they are to the gorilla? 98, well, sorry, 89.59, 89.63, 89.63, 89.62, 89.62, 89.63. <laughs> chances are your mitochondrial genome is, let's keep scrolling down here. They're all 89 point something. We get all the way down to 89.57%. Uh, I think it's pretty safe to say that your genome, whoever you are listening to this, is 89 point something percent similar for its mitochondrial genome with, a, with this particular gorilla. 
uh, there is quite a bit of difference between different gorillas, and so you might be slightly higher or slightly less to any other particular gorilla alive on Earth today, but 89%. Uh, what did we say the gorilla was and the orangutan, or sorry, gorilla and, and chimpanzee? They were 90% similar to one another. And the gorilla and the orangutan were about 87% similar. I didn't show you that, but we could have scrolled down that other list and found it was 87% similar. How similar is a human in a chimpanzee? A human in a chimpanzee. Eh, human and chimpanzee, about 89 to 90% also similar to one another. Um, actually, it might be just over 90% because I happen to know how many uh, differences there are. Well, let's go to the alignment. So this alignment is between human and gorilla, 13,976 to 15,600. That would be 1,615 or something like that, right? So a few more differences uh, between the human and the gorilla. So if I compared, if I compare, uh, I haven't, okay, I guess it's time to tell you. The difference between a human and chimpanzee in terms of numbers is like 1,450 base pairs. So they're a little bit more similar. So human and chimpanzee, the most similar to each other in mitochondrial genomes, and then all the other great apes are more different from one another than humans and chimpanzees are. Right Now this is just a proxy for looking at genetic variation, but if you were to like say, just pick out some portion of like, if I said, let's go to chromosome number three, and look at uh, 100,000 base pairs in one stretch and ask how similar they are. And I would say, like, let's put some money on it. What do you think? What's going to be, are humans and chimpanzees going to be more similar to one another in that 100,000 base pairs, or will gorillas and chimpanzees more similar? Yeah, I'm willing to bet it's probably humans and chimpanzees. I know from lots of experience, it's, it's going to be human and chimpanzee. It's going to be slightly more similar to each other. Okay. The big point here is that Answers in Genesis is working really hard to try to say that uh, humans and chimpanzees are really different genetically. See, look, they're only 80% similar. And then at the same time, they're trying to say that Todd Wood is crazy for saying that they're, they're very similar. We need to have an explanation for that. And what I've just shown you just a little bit of is a gorilla and orangutan or a gorilla and a chimpanzee are just as different, if not more different from one another than a human and chimpanzee is. And here's what I would do. I would place a bet, and I'm not a betting person, but I'd put some money on it if Answers in Genesis or somebody there or somebody out there would like to go through all the work to do the, the actual calculations using the Answers in Gen, sorry, the Institute for Creation method of calculating genetic difference between two individual organisms. I'm willing to put money that if they do that comparison, they're going to find out that gorillas and chimpanzees are no more than 80% similar to each other, and that gorillas and orangutans no more than 80% similar to each other. I'll go this far. Gorillas and bonobos, two really closely related species, are probably, in their method of calculation, 82% similar or 85% similar to one another, slightly more similar to one another but really quite different from others. In other words, using their methodology, they should be arguing they're different kinds, right? They're not related to one another. They can't possibly share a common ancestor because they're, they're too different from one another. By not doing the apples to apples comparison, they can present this 80% number to their audience and wow them with like how different humans and chimpanzees are. But they haven't told them that they're turning right around and telling their audience that human, uh, sorry, that gorillas and chimpanzees are the same kind. They're just like variations of a, of a great ape. And they're all, just 4,000 years ago, they shared a common ancestor. But they're just as different, if not more different, than humans and chimpanzees. So their number is a meaningless number. It doesn't tell you anything about the uniqueness of human beings. You need to look elsewhere to find the uniqueness of human beings than just sheer genetic variation or genetic difference as measured in this particular way. Um, so that's been my that's been my 10 year challenge to creationists is for them to do these types of calculations and to actually test their own theory, but they refuse to test it. They only ever tell you this one value, 
the difference between a particular chimpanzee and a particular human being that they've done this comparison for. You have no idea what the variation is between human beings themselves because they have not done the analysis and they refuse, they appear to refuse to do these types of analyses and spend any time actually checking their own data. It's just inconvenient. It would be an inconvenient truth if they were to do so. All right, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna call it there. Um, yeah, I was just kind of stunned that they were gonna include this particular article by Georgia Purim in their analysis and that they would talk about Todd Wood as if he's kowtowing to evolutionary biologists by simply recognizing what every biologist recognizes. See, he is a biologist and he has a little bit of understanding, right, of this of this molecular biology stuff and genetics. And he sees that when you do the relative comparisons between other species and other closely related species, and you look at humans and chimpanzees, that humans and chimpanzees have a similarity at this genetic level that suggests they're sibling or sister species to one another, just as you would if looking at any other sister species out there among other groups. And what he's arguing is that, so genetic difference isn't the thing that we should be relying on in order to make our argument for the fact that humans are special and created separately. He's saying there are other things we can use. And, and that paper has a bunch of, I don't necessarily agree with his conclusions or some, what, I don't necessarily agree that some of his other methods of determining human specialness are, uh, are all that useful. But he's recognizing the need, that, that's why the paper is called the problem, right, of similarity between chimpanzees and humans. Um, and so once again, I find that Todd Wood is being, and I apologize for supporting Todd Wood because obviously I'm causing a problem for him by doing that because Answers in Genesis thinks it's a problem that, that their enemies are siding with him. Um, and so I'm sorry, Todd Wood, for having to say you're a reasonable person and that you're looking at the evidence and trying to understand it in a faithful way rather than simply lying to your audience as Answers in Genesis is so good at doing. Um, yeah, I just, it's, this is a very unproductive route for Answers in Genesis to take, to um, attack individuals within their midst who are trying to actually provide alternative hypotheses and actually explore things in an honest way so that other individuals who look at this data and learn about it will have something other than Answers in Genesis just telling them they're fools. Um, Answers in Genesis can complain about how maybe young earth evolutionists are somehow turning young earth creationists away by creating cognitive dissonance, but there's no one better at creating cognitive dissonance than Answers in Genesis themselves and driving people away um, from the kingdom of Christ. So that's one of the reasons I get kind of worked up about this so this has been a long ramble and i know i've kind of repeated the same points over and over again but it's it's uh it's just kind of it's bewildering to me that they can continue to harp on this 80 percent number and and think that it has any meaning but maybe at the end of the day that's what it's all about it doesn't have meaning but it doesn't matter they just need a number they just need a comfort they just need to comfort their audience but what's so aggravating is this editor's note where the editor basically uses this to bash other creationists as being compromisers right go ahead and use your fake numbers and try to help your audience feel good about themselves and help yourself feel good about yourself and try to avoid hard questions but you know don't throw other christians under the bus because they're actually have their eyes open and, and are asking hard questions and actually trying to provide some realistic answers to them. It's just bad, 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 bad apologetics um, all the way around. All right. My ramble is done. My rant is done. Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Mm,